Hi all. In our last video, uh, we talked about one of the main functions of the membrane, uh, which is to block the physical passage of things into the cell and also to allow the physical passage of things into the cell. It forms a selectively permeable barrier that, uh, you know, portal or pore or um, carrier proteins can allow selective molecules in. Uh, one of the other main functions of the membrane is to regulate the passage of information into the cell. And it is mostly into the cell. Usually if the cell wants to send a signal out, it has to send a physical molecule out. Um, but when the cell is receiving information, it's often easier and more efficient uh, to simply allow information to pass inside of what signal is coming in from outside and not allow the physical molecule itself. In this case, the physical molecule the, that's carrying information that's floating around outside the cell that the cell is seeing is called a ligand. A ligand is literally something that binds to something else, right? So ligand comes from the same root word as to ligate or ligament or ligature. All of those uh, are, are things that tie things together, that bind things to other things. So a ligand is something that binds to something. And specifically, uh, in our model, what we're talking about, what a ligand is going to be binding to is a receptor. A receptor is a protein that is usually going to be found in the membrane, not always, as we'll see in the next video, but is usually going to be found in the membrane. And when it binds to the ligand, something awesome happens. Usually it conveys some sort of signal to the cell that tells the cell to do something and then the cell does something. What the cell does is completely dependent upon what hormone hits it, what type of cell it is, and everything like that. But right now, for this video, what we're going to focus on is that special binding interaction between the receptor and the ligand. All right? So, first key concept that you need to know is binding affinity. Ligands and receptors, for the most part, uh, they are very specific. One receptor binds to a particular ligand and doesn't bind to anything else, usually. So for instance, uh, you have insulin receptors in your cells. Most of your cells, almost all of your cells, have insulin receptors because insulin is a very common signal that almost every cell is going to need to receive at some point. The insulin receptor pretty much only binds to insulin. You wouldn't want something else to bind to it because then your cells would respond to this other thing as if it was uh, insulin. One receptor can really only uh, negotiate one response at a time. Uh, you, uh, cells can have huge numbers of receptors, not that huge, but certainly tens to twenties, thirties, maybe hundreds, probably not thousands, at least not on the same cell. Uh, but this regulates all of the things that that cell can see that it can respond to in the outside world. So things that you might have receptors that bind to are uh, hormones, right? You have cells that can bind to hormones and then they can get signals that the body is trying to send it. Uh, antigens or foreign materials. Uh, a, a lot of your immune system cells have receptors that bind to, for instance, bacterial cell wall components so that when they run into a bacteria, they can tell, oh, you're a bacteria, I should eat you. Um, neurotransmitters, neurons and muscles both have receptors to bind to neurotransmitters. These aren't exactly hormones because they operate over such a short distance. Um, and they're non-chemical in their effects. But still, uh, what they are is the way a signal 
can pass from one cell to the next and then trigger an action in that cell, either passing the message on with a neuron or um, you know, stimulating contraction with a muscle cell. So you want your, uh, your receptor to only bind a particular Uh, to only bind a particular type of ligand. So you see this blue receptor here can bind this blue ligand. They have a shape that matches up, that is complementary. Uh, they don't have, uh, uh, so this blue receptor can't match up with this green ligand very well. So if, you, if both of these were on the same cell, and you hit that cell with the blue receptor, the blue, or with the blue ligand, the blue receptor would activate, maybe telling the cell to take up sugar. If you hit the cell with the green ligand, then the green receptor would become activated, and uh, the cell would have a different response, possibly telling it to stimulating cell division, mitosis. Drugs often work, and this is one of the reasons why it's really important to understand this, uh, the way drugs often work is by mucking about with this system. So drugs can either be uh, agonists. An agonist is something that is capable of stimulating a receptor and turning it on. Right? So an agonist is basically like a hormone or neurotransmitter or whatever, um, except it binds when you're not making that thing. And sometimes it will bind with different binding affinity. This is a key concept. Binding affinity is a measure of how well, how specifically and how tightly this ligand binds to this receptor. So an agonist might have a different binding affinity. For instance, it may activate a receptor much more strongly than your natural hormones would. Uh, an antagonist is something that binds to a receptor, but then doesn't turn it on and stops it from being turned on by its natural ligand. It basically sits in the receptor and blocks the receptor. Again, the higher the binding affinity, the better it is at blocking that particular receptor. Um, so, we have measurements of binding affinity, uh, and I'm not gonna go into the specifics of how it's calculated. You may talk about that in a chemistry class, um, but I do want to tell you a few things about it. Uh, the quantities that measure binding affinity are K, A, and K, D. And of them, KD is the one that is more commonly used um, for very his historical reasons and, and because it's actually easier to directly measure. KA stands for the association constant. And boom. So the association constant. And it is a measure of how tightly things bind. Association means coming together. The higher the association constant, the more binding 
you get. Now, one of the things we're gonna talk about in just a second is equilibrium. Basically, this isn't like things just either bind or they don't bind, and that's it, like it's absolute, no. Things in solution, chemicals, drugs, hormones, everything like that, they're constantly binding and then unbinding and then binding and then unbinding and then binding and then unbinding. Think of it as being like a dance, right? So you've got this dance, you've got all of these people out there on the dance floor and they pair up and then they dance for a while and then they separate and then maybe they dance with somebody else for a while and then they separate and then maybe they come back to the first partner and then they separate, right? Uh, the higher your Ka, the more time you spend dancing and the less time you spend standing around by yourself. So it is a measure of how social, how much you interact as a molecule. Kd is the disassociation. constant. And here, lower is better. So your disassociation constant right here. Um, if Ka is a measurement of how much time things spend together, Kd is a measurement of how much time things spend apart, right? If, uh, if the disassociation constant is high, then you're more likely to break off the dance and go hang out by yourself. If the disassociation constant is low, then once you get in a dance, you're likely to stay with that partner for longer. So higher Ka means you get into dances easier. Uh, lower Kd means you stay with partners longer. And they're inverse, right? So you can't have something that has both a high Ka and a high Kd. Um, the they're I inverted of one another you can calculate one from the other based on it but uh for various reasons in chemistry and biology we usually measure the kd of things so if i say the kd of this is very very low you should know that that means that it binds very well and sticks together much longer so a antagonist with a very low kd will be a very effective blocking agent. It will block signals very well because it spends most of its time, like as a chaperone, sitting there blocking um, the, the hormone from binding to the receptor. If I say that this agonist drug has a very high KD, then that means that it's not a very good drug. If it has a high KD, it doesn't bind very well, and so it doesn't activate it very much. It would mean that you would need to give somebody a relatively high dose, and you would get a fairly low response. So you should definitely make sure that you understand that concept, so when you see it on a test, and I say, this drug has a very low KD, what would you expect uh, uh, to happen You know when... Uh, it's given to the patient, you will know that the answer is if it has a very high KD, then you would not expect to see much of an effect when the drug is given. In general, if a blocking agent, a, um, a, uh, uh, a antagonist has a lower KD than the natural hormone, um, then it's a fairly effective antagonist. And um, it means that at equal concentrations to the natural hormone or whatever, um, it will block half 
of the actions because they're equal. Usually you want your, your, um, your antagonist to actually have a much lower KD than the natural uh, uh, hormone. This concept that things don't either, it's always bound or it's never bound, that, that binding isn't so much an on or off, it's actually sort of a spectrum, is a concept called equilibrium. And in your chemistry class, you'll probably talk about this a lot, uh, but it's an important concept that I want you to kind of grasp the beginnings of right now. Um, equilibrium applies to pretty much everything in chemistry. It can apply to reactions, and it can apply to binding, it can apply to a bunch of other things, but here what we're going to talk about is the concept of equilibrium as it's applied to binding interactions. Uh, so with equilibrium, um, even though in reality for every molecule, it's either bound or unbound, right? You can't be both bound and unbound or not bound and not unbound at the same time. You, in a body, never actually have a situation where it's just one molecule and one receptor. That doesn't happen. You almost always have millions upon millions of molecules and millions upon millions of receptors. And they're all in a constant state of binding and unbinding. That means if you take a snapshot, like you take a little picture at any one point in time, some of the ligands are going to be bound and some of them are going to be unbound. Equilibrium is basically a measurement of what percentage, what fraction are bound versus unbound. And there are several things that will affect this. Now, this is a pretty standard binding chemical equation, right? So here we have the substance A in the presence of substance B binds to form complex AB. AB is A and B bound together. Now, in chemical reactions that you may have seen before, very simple ones, they usually have a reaction arrow that goes one direction. But in reality, very, very few reactions actually only go one re direction, and this is just, of, just as, if not more, true with binding interactions. Here, I have drawn the forwards arrow longer and the backwards arrow shorter. That means that these two things are going to have a greater tendency to bind together than they will to fall apart. And you will find more of A and B bound together than you will A separate and B separate. But that actually applies only under a certain set of conditions called the standard conditions. I'm not going to get into what the standard conditions are, um, but it involves things like A and B both being at specific concentrations, and they're in equal concentrations, and it's happening at, uh, for biological standard conditions, at, uh, uh, you know, 37 degrees Celsius, and um, in the presence of, like, they're the only things around and things like that. Um, conditions that don't always hold true in the body. There are a number of things that can affect this equilibrium, that can force our dancers together more often than they would naturally do so, or that can force our dancers apart more often than they would naturally do so. Let's take a look at these. Now remember, anything that will cause this association to happen, that will cause more binding, means that the receptor will stimulate more response. It will have a, the hormone will have a greater effect. Anything that, uh, that causes them to be more apart has the reverse of that. It means that your drug or your hormone or your whatever will have less of an effect. 
And since your entire body is pretty much run, all of your body is coordinated by these binding interactions. That's the only way any of your cells knows what any other of your cells is doing. This is actually vitally important uh, for understanding how cells in the body react to chemicals and how they coordinate with each other. So first off is something that we already talked about, binding affinity. The greater the binding affinity, um, the more the two partners like each other and the more likely they are to stick together. Remember, binding affinity can be measured as a Ka or a Kd. In this case, uh, a low Kd means that that's going to affect the binding equilibrium. And here, a low Kd, that's a Kd, leads to more binding. And we would say um, that it uh, it leads to more binding and that it uh, tilts the equilibrium towards binding. That's the way we, sh we would say it. I always think about equilibrium as being like um, like a bucket that's sort of sloshing around and you tilt it one way and more of the water sloshes that direction, you, uh, uh, you tilt the binding toward, or tilt the equilibrium towards binding, or you can tilt the equilibrium away from binding. Second, concentration, right? So you can have concentration of a, or concentration of B, or concentration of anything that's involved in this binding interaction. Most binding interactions just involve two things, but some of them involve more. In general, if you have a, a higher concentration, then you have a higher likelihood of binding. On our real dance floor, um, your, your boys and your girls can look and find somebody who they're interested in and then just walk over to them. But chemicals don't actually have eyes. They just wander around randomly and if they run into someone, they try to dance with them. And if the affinity is good, they stay dancing with them. But imagine a bunch of blind people and they're like you've got a hundred blind people and they're all on a football field and wandering around randomly, and when they run into someone, they try to dance with them. And maybe they don't like their partner. Maybe they, their partner steps on their toes, in which case they separate pretty quickly. They have a low affinity. But the first thing that has to happen is they have to run into each other. Uh, a higher concentration, let's take the same number of people in a much smaller place. Instead of on a football field, you've got 100 people in a classroom without any desks in it. We don't want to be dangerous. And they're all blind. And now they're just wandering around. And whenever they run into someone, they grab hold and try to do a little bit of dancing. What's more likely? That you're going to run into another one of these 100 people on a football field or in our classroom? Well, you're obviously more likely to run into somebody in the classroom. You just have a lot less space to wander over, and you have a relatively higher density of people there, a higher concentration. You're going to run into people more often. You're going to try dancing with them more often. Now, maybe the affinity is low. Maybe you don't dance well together, and so pretty soon you let go and then find another partner. But the first step is finding that partner. So in general, high concentration... equals more binding. And while the ideal situation is that you have a high concentration of everything, if you have a high concentration of just one of the things, that will also work. So let's say you have a blind dance on a football field. Um, and the rules of this dance are very heteronormative, like boys can only dance with girls, but you don't know until you actually like start dancing with somebody and, and somebody tries to lead, uh, whether or not you're dancing with uh, uh, an opposite sex partner or not, right? Um, so 
Uh, if you have 100 boys and 100 girls on this football stadium or football field uh, wandering around uh, uh, randomly and whenever a boy runs into a girl, they start dancing, well, is, there's not going to be very many couples dancing. Most of the couples are going to be single. They're going to spend more of their time less bound. All right. What if you have a thousand guys and a hundred girls on the same football field? The number of girls hasn't changed, but the number of guys definitely has. So we've increased the concentration of guys. What does that mean? Well, most of the guys are still going to be without partners, but the girls will spend almost all of their time dancing because, you know, they'll run into someone Chances are good. It's a 10 to 1 chance that it's going to be a guy that they run into, so they keep dancing. And then eventually they fall apart, depending upon what their affinity is. And then they will very quickly run into somebody else, and that other person who they run into is quite likely to be a guy. Now, guys are mostly going to be bumping into other guys. And then, according to the rules of this particular dance that is simulating mo molecules, uh, they wouldn't stay together. They would, you know, start dancing, they would both try to lead, and they would fall apart right away. Um... But uh, if you increase, say, the concentration of the substrate or the ligand, um, you would increase the amount of binding, even if you have the same amount of receptor. Next, temperature. Uh, temperature is the speed at which the molecules are moving. And temperature is going to actually have a pretty complicated uh, effect that we're, we're not going to get into the specifics of, but in general, higher temperature means that people are dancing faster. That has two effects. If you're dancing faster, then that means that you're going to run into people quicker. And you're going to start dancing quicker. But also, you know, you're moving around really vigorously, you're more likely to separate from the person you're dancing with, and then you'll be apart. So it actually increases both the tendency for molecules to find each other and to fall apart. In general, very low temperatures create binding, have more binding, but they also cause less specific binding. Very high temperatures will destroy binding interactions, but somewhere in the middle, which is where your body likes to stay, um, then temperatures, if you like slightly increase temperature, it will usually have the net effect of making binding happen slightly faster. But it, it does have this double-sided effect. Uh, next is contact surface. This is where our dance metaphor kind of falls down, right? Because that's a really good metaphor if what you're talking about is molecules like your ligands and your receptors are both floating in your, uh, in, in your solution, on your field, right? But that's not the way most receptor interactions happen. Usually, the ligand is floating around... Uh, uh, free in solution and the receptor is typically bound to the membrane and so while it can move side to side in the membrane it can't leave the membrane so contact surface is basically the surface area of the membrane if you have a greater amount of surface area then you are more like you have more surface exposed to water and you are more likely to have a binding interaction uh, imagine in this scenario, we have our girls are all lined up at the center field line and guys are floating randomly around. Um, if instead of being lined up in a straight line, all of the girls are packed up into a ziggy zaggy line, then you have more girls on that line and you have more area for them to meet up with a guy in. It's basically a specific way of increasing concentration when that concentration is on a surface. But in general, more contact surface, high contact surface, 
equals more binding. Last, we have inhibitors. I already talked about inhibitors. Um, antagonist drugs are basically inhibitors. Uh, these are things that bind to uh, one or the other of the partners, usually the receptor, and prevent interactions. So let's say that our dance also has a drinks table. And when a girl has a drink in her hand, she can't dance because she'll spin, spill the drink on herself. Well, the better the drinks, the more likely the girls are to have a drink in their hand. And when they have a drink in their hand, they can't dance because it will lead to spillage. And not to say the guys don't drink as well, they do, but just to labor our metaphor a bit here. Um, but then for, uh, for our purposes, like the boozier the party, uh, the less dancing that goes on. Um, the, the more inhibitors we have, and alcohol is usually a disinhibitor, but that's a different thing. Um, the more inhibitors we have, the, uh, the, the more one member of the pair or other is unable to bind, to participate in interactions, and it decreases the effective concentration of that element. So for our purposes, more inhibitors... equals less binding. All right, so to reiterate, what you need to know for this is the concept of uh, ligand receptor interactions. You need to know what binding affinity is and that it's measured in KD, and that the lower the KD, the more binding takes place. The higher the Ka, the more binding that takes place. You need to understand the concept of equilibrium, that things aren't just bound or unbound. Because we're looking at great masses of things, you're always going to have some bound and some not bound. And that which way the equilibrium tilts, we're talking about percentages. What makes things more likely to bind, spend more time bound. What makes things less likely to bind, spend less time bound. And you need to know the factors that are going to affect equilibrium. By the way, this is not a comprehensive list. Um, these, there, there are actually a lot more factors than this that affect equilibrium. These are just the ones that are going to be most important to biological equilibriums and ligand receptor interactions. Um, so they're the ones that we're most likely to encounter in our context, uh, in like a chemistry context, there's going to be a whole slew more of things that affect it.